Will democracy survive in the next couple of years? And essentially we are the same. And there are so many needs that Minnesota has. What people are saying they need right now. Access to Democracy is made possible in part by a donation from Firefly Credit Union. Firefly is the new name of U.S. Federal Credit Union, which has proudly served the financial needs of the greater Twin Cities community since 1925. At Firefly, we guide our members forward and give them the power to chase dreams by delivering the financial solutions they need to get ahead. From checking accounts to mortgages, we'll light the way. We are Firefly Credit Union, and this is life illuminated by Thomson Reuters, providing legal professionals with intelligence, technology, and human expertise they need to find trusted answers. Thomson Reuters, the answer company. Online at ThomsonReuters.com. And Dr. Charles Crutchfield of award-winning Crutchfield Dermatology in Egan. Acknowledged as one of the nation's best physicians, a Minnesota native who trained at the Mayo Clinic, Dr. Crutchfield personally treats all patients and states that experience counts and quality matters. Crutchfield Dermatology, look good, feel great, with beautiful skin. Hello, welcome back to Access to Democracy. I'm Holly Jenkins, your guest host. And uh, with me, I'm just absolutely delighted on this historic day to be here with our guest, uh, Professor David Schultz from Hamlin University. Thank you for coming on. You're welcome. Thanks for having me, of yeah, course. Yeah, you bet. And especially a day when the news is loaded with only the fourth time in U.S. history, an impeachment proceeding moving forward. Um, what are your thoughts on that? Did the Democrats take the right step in this vote today? Or will, will be a vote next week, I should say, but... Uh, well, as we're, where we are right forward. now, okay, where we are right now, this is only the fourth time that a Judiciary Committee in the House has voted on articles of impeachment. Um, Assuming it goes to the entire floor and passes, it'll only be the third time in American history that a president has been impeached, um, the previous being Andrew Johnson and then Bill Clinton. So that'll be Donald Trump gets to join a nice small select group of people and they'll head off to the Senate for a trial. Now, whether it's the right thing to do, this is gonna be an interesting question to think about here. Now, did the president, in my opinion, do something that's really horrible? Yes, he did. Um, did he do something that probably deserves um, the ranking of an impeachable offense? Yes. But the problem now, from a tactical point of view, is what happens when it goes to the Senate? Because there's very little chance, in fact, probably no chance, that the Senate is going to um, find, find him guilty and throw him out of office. So now the question becomes, what do the Democrats do the day after the acquittal in the Senate? Because that's going to come. And so I think that becomes the challenge politically. Maybe from a principled point of view, it was the right answer, impeach. But mm -hmm. I think that's the challenge going forward new now is, is what, what to do next. Okay, but even what to do next, um, you know, there was some, and that, that point came up several times that the Senate, it'll never go through the Senate. And now yeah. the Senate is saying that they're gonna collaborate closely with the White House to right. plan the next, for this hearing, um, but if the if the Democrats in the House did not impeach, aren't they setting a precedent that allows that type of corruption to just continue yeah. un, without punishment or without consequences? Yeah, right. And this is this is the dilemma that I think the Democrats face because yeah. if they don't impeach, does it set a precedent? But if they do impeach and it goes to the Senate and he's acquitted, doesn't it also set a different precedent? That's another question to think about here. Mm -hmm. uh, especially if, let's say, Donald Trump were to get reelected. You know, we don't know, but let's say he were to get reelected. What does it all mean now in terms of the larger sort of lesson of history? But second, I think what's also interesting here is that the Democrats are only doing two articles of impeachment. They're mm -hmm. doing it fairly narrowly. They're doing basically contempt of Congress and abuse of power. and. If, if I were impeaching, I would probably have extended it further. Okay. I would have included probably the obstruction of justice from the Mueller report and a few other things. 
being that there's a whole bunch of other things that I also think he did badly. Not just badly, but badly enough that they deserve perhaps impeachment. And I would have thrown all those in also if we're talking about making a, a statement or making a lesson to say that here's a whole range of things. Also, you what? Profiting um, from the presidency in terms of using your own personal property, hotels, et cetera, et cetera. So I would have wanted to set a broader precedent. So. I, I'm concerned that, that perhaps the Democrats didn't set this up as well as they could have. Remember earlier in 2018, Nancy Pelosi, when asked the question about impeachment, said, Ugh, he's just not worth it. Uh, right. I don't know if I would go that far, but I certainly might have framed it differently because right now the impeachment is not playing well with the American public. About half support it, about half oppose it. There's no movement in terms of public opinion. Uh, if I think the eye of the prize, mm -hmm. getting Trump out as president, I'm not sure how this gets us in that right direction. Mm -hmm. And that was one of the, you know, the, one of the reasons they did stick with only two articles is my understanding because otherwise they were getting called, the Democrats would get called out for everything Trump does is impeachable. Everything he does right. is impeachable. And right. all of a sudden you run that risk. And yes. so it's been a, challenging position to be in because on the one hand, yes, he's done all of these things that are yeah. um, concerning and questionable, and yet is it just the rhetoric of the Republican Party that prevented that from being a broader scope of, of um, offenses? Yeah, well, I, th I think there's a couple things going on here. I mean, part of what Trump has done is pushed boundaries in ways that we've not seen any other president push before. I mean, remember when he was running for office, and I won't repeat the language here, but you know some of the references he made to immigrants, to women in their parts of their anatomy and so forth like that? Which that he continues to do. Continues to yeah. do. Any other person would have doomed that person during the campaign, and, and the, he's gotten away with it. Partly because of what? The polarization in American society is so significant now that he's got a core base of supporters who are with him no matter what. And in fact, guess what? They actually love that type of language. The more he refers to women or immigrants or Democrats in very derogatory language, the more they cheer him on. So, so part of, if I were gonna describe it here, Donald Trump is part of something broader. You know, he's something broader about polarization, about reactionary politics. He's almost like the figurehead for something far uglier that's out there. Well, and let me ask you this. So as you pointed out, he, he's somewhat of an anomaly. We've never seen anything like this, but he he's, has a character of lying. He uh, uses vulgar language, disrespectful to majority of the world. Um, and yet we have a GOP, a Republican Party that is excusing this, that That's is right. that is allowing it to continue. And my question is, is that the new Republican Party or is there a subset of Republicans that have the guts and the wherewithal to change this and, and to bring back some respect to the office of presidency? Uh, I think it's now a new Republican Party. I think Trump has just about affected a complete takeover of that party. That you're gonna notice going into 2020, as of right now, I think it's 14 or 15 Republicans in the House um, have already announced they're retiring. These would be the people from that subset that you're talking about. Um, and what they've realized that what? They've become marginalized within their own party. Uh, they really don't have a place to sort of speak and, um, and, 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 and articulate uh, an alternative vision. So what Trump has really done successfully um, is, is remade the party in his image and I actually argued at one point in one of my blogs that what the Republican Party has become at this point is essentially the Klan but without the robes um, mm. in many ways. It's become what? It's become a racist party, it's become anti-woman, it's become anti-gay, it's become fill in the blank, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, I mean, the kind of language that Trump uses, the kind of policy he's been pursuing, uh, I mean, what's the difference between him and the policies that David Duke you know, former Grand Wizard of the KKK who actually endorsed him. Um, uh, what's the difference between the two of them? There's not much of a difference here. So, so Trump represents that ugly side of American politics that, that's always been there. Um, but, but he's given it a new voice and legitimacy, much in the way that what? 
George Wallace did back in the 1960s. Well, and he's justified making all of these immoral behaviors acceptable. Yes. And so you're seeing more of that rising up yeah. um, in in the state. So these this subset of Republican folks who, who don't support him but who are stuck being kicked out in a yeah. sense of the Republican Party, is there room in the Democratic Party for to expand, to include views that are maybe a little bit outside the scope, or has the Democratic Party also gotten so um, dug their heels in, so set in their views that they can't reach out and accept some of these other more moderate Republicans, I would say. Yeah. This is interesting because I think the Democratic Party is in a couple of different directions now. Now take us back to 2016. In part why the Democrats lost is that uh, suburban women, people of color, young people um, in the urban liberal state home, they weren't enamored by Hillary Clinton. 2018, the Democrats do well in Minnesota and nationwide, mostly because all those groups, but especially whom? Suburban women come out, vote in very large percentages. And the reason why, support them. Now, the reason why I mention this is that the, the politics of suburban women is, a, is probably socially liberal, um, mm -hmm. a little bit more, let's say, fiscally conservative compared to, let us say, uh, the urban liberals, people of color, young people. And the reason why I mention this is that to, to some extent, the future of the Democratic Party is more on the, sen the sense of, are they gonna become more of a suburban centrist party or they could become more of an ur sort of an urban liberal party. And part of what we're seeing being played out going into the 2020 elections is a little of that. Um, is the party gonna be moving towards more of a direction, let us say, of a Bernie Sanders, for example? Um, or is it gonna be moving more towards a centrist party, um, an Amy Klobuchar direction? And I think that's where there's a challenge here. And the Democrats are not of one mind. Mm -hmm. Whereas the Republicans seem to be of one mind that it's Donald Trump, there's more I don't know, openness here and possibles, possibilities for the Democrats to create a, a, a broader net mm -hmm. if they take that challenge up and recognize that, guess what? Maybe not everybody has to agree to the exact same thing. Right, right. And do you, do you see it heading that direction or do you see the, Dem I mean, if you had a crystal ball, would you see them staying farther and farther to the left or do you see them throwing out this broader umbrella? Or is it just anyone's guess at this point? If you don't know, then I'm not going to. Anyone's go. guess, but but if the Demo you know, I, I think if the Democrats at least short term want to win, they have to hold suburban women in the fold. Mm -hmm. I mean, think about, uh, for example, Minnesota, the second district, you know, represented by Angie Craig right now. You know, Angie Craig was very successful in running the second time, in part for reaching out, you know, and doing well in the suburbs. Uh, Compared to, let us say, a, um, a Ilhan Omar in Minneapolis or a Betty McCollum in St. Paul who come from more liberal bases, uh, Angie Craig doesn't. Her, her, her base is, is not quite as, as liberal. And so I think what the Democrats have to recognize is that within the party, you're going to have a lot, some people who are going to be representing areas that are, that are not as far to the left. And how do you now forge public policies, forge campaign platforms that recognize that not everybody is over with Bernie Sanders and Elizabeth Warren, but that you need to have some of those um, other supporters to be able to hold together a coalition to win. Okay. Well, and speaking of um, Angie Craig, uh, this is just the start. You know, I know that the 2020 election pretty much started the day after the 2018 mm -hmm. election. Mm -hmm. However, today's uh, back page of the Star Tribune had a full page ad pulled out against Angie Craig telling her to stop the witch hunt from an organization, a national organization that I've never heard of. So I dread this coming year and the amount of negative and misinformation, just rhetoric that's going to be um, coming in our mailboxes, in the ads, in the commercials. Um, we just have a, a long you're ahead, I'm afraid. We're going to have an especially long year because Minnesota has turned into Ohio. And what I mean by that, Ohio has traditionally been one of those half a dozen or ten swing states that just are dominated by the candidates for presidential elections. Most, a lot of candidates visit there and a lot of commercials there. 
Minnesota, in many ways, has become a swing state. We know Trump wants to pick up the state. He's very well organized here. He got close, you know, back in 2016. So we're going to see a lot of national money come into the state of Minnesota for the presidential race. But we also what? have a competitive um, Senate race, in, you know, with Tina Smith is running again against Jason Lewis. Angie Craig's race is very competitive, second district. Dean Phillips, third district, very competitive. Then we have probably a competitive Colin Peterson in the seventh. Uh, we have a first district competitive. We have in Minnesota more competitive federal office seats mm. as a proportion than any other state in the country. If I were to go out on a limb, I would say we're going to see 150 to 200 million dollars um, in campaign money pumped into the state yeah. of Minnesota. You and I are in the wrong business. We yeah. ought to be <laughs> we ought to be selling advertising space on television because that's where it's going to be. Yeah, no, it's just going to be just a, a overload of information of, of misinformation, I yes. should say. Um, so speaking of the Minnesota races, how, you know, this year on the primary ballot, even though there is more than one. Um, individual who is come, trying to come up against Donald Trump. His is the only name that Republicans will have to vote for in the primary. Um, how, how do you, do you think that there are state statutes to change to not allow that type of behavior? Um, mm -hmm. Because aren't we, aren't we taking the right for a free election away? Yeah, we're, we're essentially telling um, members of the, people who want to vote Republican, uh, you have one choice and only one choice, and there's a right to vote issue there. On the other hand, how, how the Republican Party is defending it, and I'm not saying I agree with this, how the Republican Party is defending is, is saying what? It's our party, we get to do what we want, um, um, but that's not fair. It's mm -hmm. not fair, and what they're doing is sort of insulating Donald Trump from any type of um, fair competition or challenge whatsoever. So yes, the Republicans are, are, are what, jerry-rigging it, the party, but that speaks to exactly the point we were mentioning before. The Republican Party has so closed around Donald Trump, mm -hmm. they're willing to do what? Basically rewrite their party rules to say, we're not even going to let anybody else challenge him. Even though, if they were to challenge him, he probably would win anyhow, um, but we're not even going to give them that opportunity to do that. Yeah, that's to me just almost disgraceful. It's it just is. hard to believe that. So you, you add something like that together with social media and dare I say Twitter, um, Money in Politics, Citizens United, all of these things have are, are spurring just a lack of any faith in our representative democracy. And how in the world can we bring back? I, we've lost it. We've lost representative democracy, and that's a huge threat to our future. So how is that going to change? I mean, how do we bring back representative, it's, it's gone. Right, well there's two things. There's obviously institutions and there's people, all right. Now clearly we need to make a variety of institutional changes in terms of what, how we run campaigns and elections and who funds them and so forth. But what you're getting at is also something fundamental. It's about education. It's about the idea of saying that, that to empower people, you have to provide them with the, the knowledge that we need to have to be able to make our choices as, 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 as citizens or as voters. As we speak, it's the end of the semester at Hamlin. Mm -hmm. My closing lectures um, in American politics were on the role of the media in American politics in talking about, for example, how about six companies, for-profit corporate companies, control 90% of the media access in the United States in terms of what's heard, what's not heard, et cetera, et cetera. And the reason why I talk about that, I mention that to my students, is to say that if we expect the press or the media to provide the information that we need to know to be able to make good choices, I would give it up. They're not going to do it because it's, it, it's not necessarily their profit incentive to do it. So it brings us back to education. Mm -hmm. And one of my um, pet concerns for many years is that we really don't provide good civic education um, in school anymore. Part of it's a consequence of the fact that what? That civics is not tested on any of the national standardized tests. And as I talk to a lot of high school teachers, they say, well, God, I agree with you, Professor Schultz. It'd be great if we could actually talk about civics education or about voting. But you know what they say to me? It's not being tested, therefore we don't have any opportunity to do anything. So if I were, imagine this is my magic wand. If I mm -hmm. were waving my magic wand, um, among other things I would have 
is a senior class on civics education, which culminated in, at the last semester of their senior year, of what? us registering them to vote, explaining to them how to do a few different things in terms of providing information they needed to know. Because at the end of the day, so many of my students, even after taking my class, still say they don't feel like they know enough. Right. Um, and when you don't feel like you know enough, it's easy to trick people too. Well, and I think that's you hit on such a key point is the fact that civics is in a lot of ways simply being taught in the home now. It's, yes. it's, there's not a, a curriculum right. course on it. Right. And, and it should be from, you know, at the very latest middle school, they should be talking about these things, if not sooner, and make it part of our lifestyle. Because if you're learning your civics simply from your parents, now you're gonna become, you're learning from a biased party. And right. there's always gonna be some bias every step of, of the way. But there, there was, there were civics classes and, and they need them. I mean, as I, as an adult, hadn't quite figured out some of the rules of the different layers of our county government. Sure. How are we expecting the next generation to to not only be engaged and activated, it, but motivated to stay invested in politics and getting to the voting booth and making a difference? Um, now, I think some young kids are ex very, very hard ad advocates mm -hmm. on certain issues. But how do we um, expand that interest and really keep them engaged in the process, not just from the voting day, but to follow along? And, and even the impeachment hearings, I think a lot of people are confused about what's happening. No, you're, no, you're right. Um, I was going to say, I mean, you're, you're asking a lot of $64,000 questions, which are really good ones here. I mean, again, part of it starts probably starting at K through 12, just mm -hmm. in terms of the fact that, that we really do need to be giving more space, more opportunity for teachers to be able to talk about the fundamentals of American government. Uh, but we also, I think, uh, need to be thinking in terms of how not just our educational institutions, but again, our media, yeah. our yeah. social media, where so much of the information is coming from, to what extent have they become perhaps not the best sources of information anymore. You know, Mark Zuckerberg recently announcing and saying he's not gonna police um, blatantly, you know, false ads on Facebook um, is a good example of what? Um, putting profits before any type of um, concepts of democracy or, you know, social responsibility. So at some point, um, again, I wish I had the answer to this question here, we need to be thinking in terms of a variety of ways of providing education, not just for students, but for adults too. Because think of all the adults out there who are just swimming or drowning maybe in all this sea of misinformation out there. Absolutely. Um, how do they sort it out from you know what's true versus false? And you know, as immigrants, we hope we will continue to welcome immigrants for our foreseeable future, uh, if not forever, but um, they have to take some classes. And yeah. our everyday citizens don't. Yeah. So it's kind of, um, you know, there's there's a lot of opportunity for in, in expanding your profession and your role. And on that area, in this current administration, how has Betsy DeVos and this administration impacted your role as an educator in just the role of public education yeah. in yeah. some ways across the country. Well, she's done nothing to make my job easier. Mm -hmm. um, in fact, made my job harder in the sense in a variety of ways. Harder for my students to get student loans, which means they have to now work, which means they can spend less time doing what? Studying, for example. Um, or or, t or retracting on Title IX sexual assault investigations so that uh, my male and female students um, feel less sure or less confident that if something were to happen to them, you know, would you know, would there be a process in place to protect them against sexual assault? Um, but also, I'm just not seeing at the college level. But when I go back and I talk to um, high school teachers, they're really not seeing anything that this Department of Education is doing that would strengthen. Uh, um, the, the quality of education, um, strengthen um, knowledge about the American government and political process. And in fact, if one were being so sinister or conspiratorial, one would say it's on purpose. Why? Because the less people know about the political process, the more it empowers people like Donald Trump mm -hmm. to be able to, to do the things that he wants to do. Yeah.
Yeah, no, I think that's um, that's become more and more clear as you see the efforts working against the public education system. Sure. And forcing more people into um, charter schools and other schools that can teach us select bias. Um, I want to, before we finish, we just have a few minutes left, but you're, uh, you had a book out in, I think it was in 2015, The Swing States, and, and you talk about a theory that it really comes down to the 2020 election, comes down to just a few select counties across the country. And you've come out with a second edition on right. that book. Do you want to expand a little bit sure. on this theory and sure. let sure. us know what we have to look forward to or what county should we be watching? Okay, sure. Okay, so... Right now, I can say that the 2020 presidential election is probably over in at least 40 states. And what I mean by that, because of the Electoral College, we know what's going to happen in what? New York, California, Mississippi, Alabama, et cetera, et cetera. We're down to maybe 20, they'd be down to 10 states. These are the swing states that are going to perhaps decide the election. But we've also found in the research that I've done that within those different swing states, such as what? The New Hampshires, the Floridas, the Ohio's, the Wisconsin's, the Michigan's, Iowa's, perhaps Minnesota. Um, there's only a few counties in each of those states that matter. Um, and so we're really, and this shows you how polarized we are, mm -hmm. that we're really down to what? Only a few swing voters in a few swing counties in a few swing states that really decide the election in the United States. Uh, that's speaking to what? The degree of polarization. That's speaking to the way the Electoral College is malfunctioning these days. So that's what we should be thinking about going into 2020, that the race for the presidency is probably down to just a small handful. Now, if I want to be totally humorous, okay. Okay, <laughs> now the New York Times has said that Wisconsin is the is is one of those swing states. And in fact, it's arguing that's, that's the only swing state that matters right wow. now, okay? Mm -hmm. In Wisconsin, my research research has pointed out that the most important county in Wisconsin is Brown County. Brown County is where Green Bay is. Um, whoever wins Brown County wins Wisconsin. So I was kidding with somebody and saying, do you realize that the fate of the presidency might hang on Packers fans? Well, go Packers. I'm a, I'm a <laughs> diehard cheesehead, so <laughs> I'm not too disappointed to hear that. But, uh, but that is a little scary. It is scary because beyond whether you like the Packers or not, what we're down to is what? Yeah. It might just be a few thousand people yeah. that decides the presidency. And that's kind of scary because I, I'm afraid that that lends itself to people believing their vote doesn't matter. Yeah. Except in those 10 counties. Yeah. And unfortunately, and, it's starting to look like that at the presidential level. Oh, boy. Yeah. That's, because cause, cause of the way things have been, have just the way things are flowing at this point. Yeah. So are you making a case that we should be, um, is it time for a change in the electoral system? Yes. <laughs> are yes. we overdue? <laughs> yes, we are. As, as I left my students with sort of a closing message, to, um, in the last day of school, I said, we have a constitution that's roughly 230 years old, mm -hmm. built for a completely different era that was pre-industrial revolution, pre-telegraph, mm -hmm. telephone, social media, Twitter, et al. Even if designed well initially, we have to be asking the question, is it designed to address the types of problems and issues that we need to address in the 21st century? Mm -hmm. And I've become increasingly more skeptical that that old machinery can work in a new era. Yeah, well, I hope that your classes continue to be filled with students. How are you gonna keep them engaged and coming back? I'm afraid they're becoming disengaged, so what are you doing to keep your kids what Motivate, I, your students motivated and oh, learning. Okay, if you come to my office, my <laughs> office looks like a landfill. I have, among other things, a Donald Trump and a Barack Obama Chia Pet. I have the entire collection of presidential Pez dispensers, of which doesn't include Donald Trump. They haven't done those yet. Um, a rubber chicken, um, several magic wands, um, and other really weird things. But See. it's a way to entertain and, br and bring my students to come to class by making them laugh a well, little bit too. Whatever it takes and then you continue to educate them on the importance of civics yes. and being engaged. Thank you so much for being here. This went really fast. I hope you'll come back again soon. Of course, thank All you. All right, thanks a lot. Sure.